Chapter 14, liquids and solids. Okay, there's a lot more to this chapter in the textbook, but the textbook is really more of a 3A level book, and so I'm skipping a bunch of the stuff. So that's why, because there's actually six sections, and we're only going to talk about parts of three of them. So let's review what we know about gases and solids, and liquids are kind of in between. So gases have low density, because there's lots of space between the particles. They're highly compressible, and they expand to fill their containers. Um, so that's, you know, gases are kind of weird. Solids have higher density. They are at most slightly compressible, and they are rigid. They retain their shape. They retain their volume. So here's an illustration of, of a solid, and the particles are very close to each other. The particles in a liquid are also close to each other, but liquids do not retain their shapes. They, they can take on the shape of their container. But they also have relatively high densities, pretty similar to the solids, um, and they're really not compressible either. So let's look, about, look at what happens when a substance changes state. And we'll use water as an example because water is probably the only pure substance that we experience in all three of its physical states. We call them water and ice and steam. So if we take ice at minus 20 degrees Celsius and we add heat to it, the ice will warm up. It will warm up until it reaches a temperature of zero degrees Celsius. At that point, the ice will begin to melt. And so here we have ice and water. What is interesting is that as the ice begins to melt, the temperature will not rise until all the ice has melted. It doesn't, doesn't necessarily make sense just, you know, when you think about it. But the water and the ice together will be at zero degrees Celsius. Once all the ice has melted, then the water will start to warm up. And the water warms up and warms up until we get to the boiling point. 100 degrees Celsius at one atmosphere, the water begins to boil. And again, we have a flat spot in this graph. So the water begins to boil, and the temperature of the water does not increase above 100 degrees Celsius until all the water has boiled away. So if you're making spaghetti and the water just started to boil, or if you forgot about it for 10 minutes and it's been boiling for 10 minutes, the temperature of the water is the same. Even though you've been throwing heat at it through the burner on your stove, the temperature of the water is the same. Once all of it, the temperature of boiling water is always the same. As soon as it starts boiling, it's 100 degrees Celsius, and it'll stay there until all of the liquid has boiled away. Then it gets hotter, fast. That's when your pot kind of boils up, burns up. Yeah. But until all of the, as long as there's some water there, it'll stay at 100 degrees Celsius. As soon as all of that liquid is converted to steam, then the temperature will rise. So after it converts to the gas state, then the temperature goes up again. The reverse also works. You take steam and you cool it down. The temperature goes down and until you get to 100 and it starts condensing. And then the temperature will stay at 100 degrees until all the water has condensed. And now you have just liquid water and it cools down and cools down and when it begins to freeze it will stay at zero degrees Celsius until all of it has frozen. Have you ever wondered why they water the citrus orchards when a freeze is predicted? <laughs> to moderate the temperature. So if you have your citrus orchard and you've got water standing in the fields, or at the very least, the ground is very wet. As, as water freezes, it stays at that freezing point. So farmers don't care about Celsius, they care about Fahrenheit. Water freezes at 32 degrees Fahrenheit. And they get worried at, what, about 26 for the oranges? 
if the oranges are at 26 degrees Fahrenheit for a certain period of time, they will be damaged. And so by putting the water in the fields, even though it, it begins to freeze, the temperature of that water will not go down below 32 degrees Fahrenheit until all the water has frozen. And so you can push off the temperature drop until hopefully the sun comes up and rescues you and the temperature of the air goes up again. That's why water, watering the ground helps to moderate the temperature. It's kind of cool. Because there's so much water it can't all freeze? Well, it freezes. Freezing is actually an exothermic process. It gives off heat. And so as the water freezes, it releases heat and the temperature remains constant. So the temperature is constant down here on the ground and then the fans are helpful to, to blow things around. Um, but the temperature down there can't go below 32 until all the water has frozen. And that's going to take a while f for it to freeze. Will moving water freeze? Moving water will freeze, but not, uh, not as easily. Not yeah. So standing water will freeze faster than moving water. Pardon me? Oh, where you throw water in the air and it freezes before it hits the ground? Yeah, the, the last time I was home for Christmas, um, the high that day was minus 12, <laughs> Minnesota. And the low was minus 26. And so we had heard about this. So we boiled a pot of water, and we got our jackets and our mittens on and stuff, and we went outside and we threw the boiling water into the air, and it froze before it hit the ground. It's boiling crazy. Water. Boiling water. And what's really bizarre, and I was talking to my students at CLS yesterday about this. Is that, was, is that when it happened? You're like, I'm going to be a chemistry teacher. No, I was already a chemistry teacher. <laughs> yeah. Um, we were talking about it, and um, I, I haven't had time to read the link. A student Googled it while we were talking about it and found um, fairly recently, I think just last month, somebody proposed a good explanation for why that happens. Boiling water will freeze like that better than cold water will. It has something, it's very complicated. It has something to do with the stretching of the bonds and stuff and becomes more like water, yeah, more like, it like ice. It snaps it back into place real fast, right? Yeah, it's kind of a momentum thing. Well, don't they say that putting hotter water in your ice pit trays faster? Yeah, supposedly. Of cold yeah, which is pretty counterintuitive, but yeah, bizarre, right? But almost anything, like, can you have any rapid change from one extreme to another or some crazy traffic? Yes. Yes, in case the YouTube didn't, people didn't hear that. Almost any time you have extreme changes, some crazy crap happens. <laughs> <laughs> we won't say who said that. Elliot. Elliot, yes, you can guess. Okay. So. So what do you need to know about this? Okay, you should know that the normal boiling point of water at one atmosphere is 100 degrees Celsius. The Celsius temperature scale was based on the boiling point and freezing point of water. The normal freezing point of water at one atmosphere is zero degrees Celsius. And those freezing and boiling temperatures will be slightly different at different atmospheric pressures. And so that's why we specify at one atmosphere. Different elevations, yeah. So if you go high up in the mountains, water will boil at a lower temperature. And if you have a pressure cooker, which allows the pressure inside the pot to increase above one atmosphere, the water will boil at a higher temperature. And that's why a pressure cooker cooks food faster, is because the temperature gets higher than 100 degrees. Because if you've got water in there, it's going to be at 100 degrees when it boils. And you can't get it any hotter unless you put a lid on it and clamp it on and allow the pressure to build up, then the temperature can get higher. So that's, that's how pressure cookers work. Um, but those, those two flat places in that heating curve um, help us to understand why these two temperatures um, are so, so useful 
in determining the Kelvin temperature scale, because they came up with this scale hundreds of years ago. Well, maybe not hundreds. Yeah, probably hundreds. I think it was like 1600, 1700, something like that. Um, because you can make something be at zero degrees Celsius. You put ice and water together, you let it sit and, and e equilibrate a little bit, ta-da, zero degrees. You don't need fancy equipment. You want something that's 100 degrees, you boil some water, ta-da, 100 degrees. And so you can make a thermometer and calibrate it without using any fancy equipment. So it's kind of cool. But you should know those boiling point, the boiling point and freezing point of water. Then the density of liquid water, um, you should also know, it's pretty easy, it's one, one gram per milliliter. And that's not a coincidence either. That has to do with how the units were defined. The interesting thing about water, and we'll, I think we talk about this more in a, a different chapter, the density of ice is less than the density of water. And that's really weird. Most solids are slightly more dense. But ice is a little bit less dense, and that's why ice cubes float. See? Floating ice cubes, they always float because they're less dense. What's the expansion? Why? Because the expansion? Because when, when water forms into ice, it forms kind of an open structure. The molecules arrange, I think it's a... Is it hexagonal? I think it's hexagonal, little rings. And they form a crystalline structure that's more open than in liquid water where the particles are just milling about. And so the, there's actually a little more space, and that makes the ice less dense. So that's why the expansion happens when you freeze water. Yes. When you freeze water, it expands because it's less dense. You have the same mass, but now it takes up more volume. So if you've ever frozen an, an unopened bottle of water, you know that it'll actually break in the freezer. Um, people in colder climates are very aware of this. In Minnesota, you can't leave a six-pack of Diet Coke in the car overnight because you come out in the morning and it's exploded all over the place and frozen. Because as it freezes in the can, it'll pop the top open and spray all over the place. Um, pipes freeze. So in Minnesota, you go, you know, if you go south for the winter, you can't leave your house unheated because the water in the pipes inside your house will freeze and burst and they'll break metal pipes. And so if you have an irrigation system, you have to blow all the water out of it or it'll break over the winter when it freezes. And, so, you know, water gets into the roads and freezes into little cracks and makes bigger cracks, and so the roads get all torn up. They even have to do it, like, in, up in the vast lake. Like yeah, mountains. yeah, even up in the mountains here where they get the freezing temperatures. They have to flush the whole house. Yeah, you got to get the water out because if it freezes, it will break your pipes. Yeah, and, so when, and then when the pipe breaks, you know, it freezes, but it hasn't frozen solid yet, so it's not like, oh, you've got this chunk of ice in this broken pipe. No, you had enough ice to break the pipe, and then there's just enough left that the water can come through and flood your house. So, big, big mess. Like overhead, yeah, the overhead, overhead pipes are really <laughs> lovely because then they just get everything really wet. So, it's just, you know. But it's a good thing in other ways that ice is less dense because if, if ice was more dense than water, then in the colder areas when the lakes freeze... As the ice forms on the top, because that's where the air is colder, it would sink to the bottom, and the ice, the, the lake would freeze solid, which would kill all the fish. And that would be a bummer. But it freezes on top, and it stays on top, and so then underneath, there's a layer of water, and the fish can live through the winter. Wouldn't the earth flood as well? I mean, if you have the polar caps and the ice, wouldn't it cause a displacement of water that wouldn't the earth flood? Yeah, I think it probably would because as the, as the water froze, it would go down. But wouldn't it be constant? Wouldn't it kind of be like it goes down and then it goes... It, I don't know. It stay, I mean, it sounds like it'd be at some state point, state. wouldn't the ice go back to the liquid state? Well, if it warmed it? up, but like up, up at the North Pole where things just stay pretty cold all the time. Can ice... Does, will ice stay ice at really high pressure? No, right? Well, the, the pressure affects, affects how it freezes. Even in water, right? Because mm -hmm. it was deeper. Yeah. 
Because at a certain point, it would hit a point where it would start melting again. Yes, it, it might, yeah. I, ice will, under pressure, ice will melt, and that's why ice skates work. So you have this narrow metal blade that you're, you've got on your ice skate, and that puts pressure on the ice, which causes a little bit of melting, and that's why it's so slippery. That's why you can skate. Interesting discussions. Good. Water is freaky. It, it really is. Okay, so concept check. During the process of melting ice by adding heat, the temperature of the ice liquid water slurry or mixture, what does it do? Does it stay constant? Does it increase? Does it decrease or cannot be predicted? It stays constant. So the temperature will stay constant until all the ice has melted. Well, you're melting by adding heat, then it'll increase. 